So again, everyone, uh, welcome to the Modular Clubhouse. And today we have a very special guest with us. The one, the only, the the, the man, the myth, the legend, Eric Schlappi. Or Slappy. How, how would you pronounce your last name, Eric? Uh, Schlappi. Slappy. Okay, so great. It's, it's probably wrong. I recently found out that it's Swiss, uh, so I don't really know how it's pronounced there's more more ease in it i believe originally. <laughs> probably well the, the the swiss are quite similar to the dutch in their pronunciation especially in the sch sounds so if i would pronounce this as a dutchman i would probably say uh sloppy but that's that. That might not be this the right sound. So we probably need to uh, ask a a native Swiss. But you're in Grenoble, so you're not that far from the from the Swiss border, are you? Not too far. Indeed. But how did you get end up in in Grenoble of all places? Um, my partner is working on her PhD here. Oh, that's great! Superb, superb. Uh, so if I think about Grenoble and I think about academic work, the, the first thing that comes to mind is CERN. <laughs> We're not that cool, I don't uh, think. No, but still, uh, still, <laughs> I've, I've, I've never, I've never finished any PhD, so I'm, I'm still impressed with anyone who's actually working on it. So yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure she could correct me, but I understand that there's a lot of different labs here and uh oh yeah it's one it's one of the hot spots absolutely i uh i uh i studied physics and astrophysics here at the university and we always we were always drooling about everything that was going on in well in that specific area where you are right now and not just because of CERN, but because of all the other cool things that were happening back there uh but again <laughs> i do digress there's also Sorry. uh arterias here too i've only got to meet a couple people but yeah um. they are there as well yeah i totally forgot and they have been and they've been so kind to me and the channel as well so they, they're great people absolutely who have you uh, met from uh, arturia if you may ask <laughs> um well i met edward at the uh at super booth and have made a couple friends uh rasmus and maro since I came here, but <laughs> <laughs> things have been, uh, it's like, oh, we're going to hang out. And it's like, oh, everyone has COVID. Maybe maybe everyone should just stay home and play video games. Oh, yeah. And play with their synthesizers, of course. Or play play with their synthesizers, yes. No, that's great. That's great. But before before we digress, Eric, um, I do have to thank you for, uh, for, for, for agreeing to join us on this uh, beautiful uh, uh, Tuesday nights for us here in the Central European time zone. Um, I do want to thank everyone else who has been able to join right now. And um, yeah, let's, uh, I would say, let's kick this off. So, um, well, first of all, Eric, how did you, how did you get into music overall? How, how, how is your musical upbringing? Uh, were you very into music as a kid growing up or how did that all, that, that, that whole thing happen? Yeah. <laughs> um <y> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question probably then. <laughs> it's it's just it's just long, but um yeah, I've I've always been into music. Um mm -hmm. I don't my uh I don't know. More along the line, I got pretty obsessed with just finding the weirdest, strangest, most extreme types of music, and that, uh, that's most, <laughs> 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 that's probably most of my teenage years. And Where you were actually days, just I'm... trying to figure out all of the, the extremes on the music spectrum, or? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I think the first uh first stuff I really liked was like um you know death metal and mm -hmm. uh skinny puppy and the wipeout excel soundtrack so um that that was great absolutely these days I mostly listen to 
abstract electronic music and mm -hmm. I think the only thing with vocals and I listen to is I still like death metal but, <laughs> um, who doesn't come on that's that's the one thing that brings all synthesis together is is a, a hidden love for either punk or extreme metal I think I thought it was skinny puppy <laughs> isn't that the same <laughs> kind of yeah absolutely absolutely so then well how did you from from from, from that well uh looking for the most extremes how did that then turn into um a a a, a background because from from what i've read online you, you did finally become uh a a trained musician of course you did go to uh, the conservatoria right no i do not count as a trained musician no, um, but you, you were you were schooled in in, in 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 the musical sciences, right? No, I'm an engineer. I mean, mm -hmm. I've gone to music school, but I didn't get very far with it. And there's okay. I have a friend in Portland who was teaching me piano in the last year or two. Um, mm -hmm. I played drums and guitars and metal bands for a long time. Um, I've played keys and various bands too but usually synths are more fun for me to play by myself and uh mm -hmm. you know drums is more fun to play with other people absolutely um, i understand that no and i now see where my um uh where i was mixed up i did see conservatory for recording arts and sciences and that that's what i interpreted as being. Where, where did you find that i thought i uh, scrubbed that from the internet Whoa, the the internet works in mysterious ways. <laughs> no, it's um, still on LinkedIn, actually. Oh, that's awful. I'll, uh, <laughs> um, that's a audio engineering school I went to in um, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, in two thousand and four. Uh, yeah, uh, and. Uh, yeah, and then I, because um, I thought I wanted to be a recording engineer, but, um, and that took me to New York, where I briefly worked in recording studios and live sound, mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> uh, I didn't, I think at that time I didn't realize what a social position uh, being a recording engineer is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think I like the, yeah, I like the gear, um, having Obviously. the hustle, yeah, <laughs> having to sell yourself to bands, telling them that uh, you could do, you know, a better job than Steve Albini. Uh, <laughs> that I couldn't do that, um, and that seemed to be part of the gig. Oh yeah, uh, that's it's all part of that same game, right? So yeah. <laughs> but 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 then finally you did see the lights and you you went into engineering right uh eventually yeah i worked live sound for a few years and worked in vintage synthesizer stores and then uh what well, live sound can be pretty bleak but that that convinced me that i would rather uh yeah do the math mm -hmm. and uh, um yeah this was in new york and I went yeah. to City College in New York and got my uh, electrical engineering degree. Um, pretty much this whole this whole time, uh, like from the start, since I was, I don't know, 18, 17, yeah. 16, I knew I wanted to build synths and guitar yeah. stuff. Uh, it's just awesome. it took me a long time to get there. Yeah, and, and what, the, what, what actually led you to that point where you were able to identify that, that, that dream or or purpose or goal within yourself as you said well you were you were of course looking into all kinds of music growing up but that eventually distilled or crystallized into in, into that well that i mean maybe approach, when yeah. i was like yeah i i mean it's always been i think i was like <laughs> i think i was obsessed when i with guitar pedals when i was maybe like 14 or 15 i was trying to make guitar <laughs> sound like synths Wow. Which uh, is not, I don't know. There's ways to do it, but um, 
the I think it's generally more fun to uh, have synth sound like synths actually, but it took me <laughs> a lot of years to decide <laughs> that. Um, and what was yeah. your first synth? So when, 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 while you were playing with guitars and pedals, um, that, that, there came a time when you actually either built your first synth or you bought your first synth or you got your first synth. What was that um, uh, process like for you? Well, I, you know, I had, um, I think I circuit bent a bunch of synths and uh, my uncle gave me a Casio CZ1000, which is pretty awesome. And I bought a TX81Z because the guy from Wumpscut used one. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, I. All the Junos are cheap then, so there was some point where I bought all the Junos. Um, my favorite synth though is the Micro Moog. When I was working uh, in a vintage synth store in Manhattan, nice. I did that. And it's uh, just has the gnarliest frequency modulation of. <laughs> I've I mean, only that, I've only seen videos of the of the micro core, so yeah. <laughs> not the micro core, the micro mug. Micro mug, sorry, apologies. Yeah. So uh, that's that's still one of my favorite things, but oh, yeah, I mean, great. I I just I like I like all the synths. <laughs> uh, the more alien the sounds you can make with it, the better. And and that's of course when when you did get into engineering. Uh, did you already have that plan to say, well, I'm going to do an engineering school uh, for the sole purpose to build your own synths? Or was that something that was just in tangent it, with that? Or No, it it was the plan. Um, Great. It's always been the plan. And there's been various points where I forgot about the plan where like, you know, you put all this effort into engineering school and then you're like, well, maybe I should be an engineer. Um, mm hmm and you know building synths and pedals seems less important and then you get the engineering job and you realize how much that sucks and mm -hmm. then you realize remember what the original plan was yeah. and uh, at least that's that's the way it worked for me yeah so so during college you you, you worked at these uh, these the vintage uh, synth stores um did you did you did you make any music during that time as well or yeah um yeah i it was i didn't play a ton of shows back then because it's it's pretty mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty hard to play shows in brooklyn when the best bands <laughs> are playing every night <laughs> but um i pretty pretty much up until recently i've always been in a couple different bands um i think the uh, going back to 2004 or so, there's a band called The Wretch um, with Michael Weeks, who actually came into my shop and um, bought some synths, and uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's been a long friendship. He oh, that's great. Um, uh, that's actually the um, if you're familiar with Metasonics. Uh, Mike was is is still a close friend of uh, Eric Barber, and uh, the name of one of the Metasonic synths was named after the Wretch. Um, and yeah, I played in a uh, metal band. I think you can still find some recordings of called Tech Assist Void. With Tech uh, Assist, just, sorry, Tech Assist. Uh, Pegasus Void. Oh, Pegasus um, Void. Pegasus. I'm just looking it up. Uh, void you said uh, okay let's see if we can find that <laughs> there's not <laughs> there's there's a record that was recorded on tape and the first song is 30 something minutes long that's uh <laughs> just played metal forever is that one no that's that's different probably no, different yeah i can't find it unfortunately but th so so and so then then my assumption would be it's either power metal or uh, or prog. Doom, just straight oh, doom. Oh, straight doom. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love that. Um, I love that. And then I think my first album 
that I put out was uh, Negatech, which was released in 2008, I think. Um, and then I released another one in 2012 as Able Archer uh, 1983, I think, um, called Bittersweet Moon Landings, which mm -hmm. is sort of like, uh, I don't know. It's a strange record. I played a lot of guitar, really psychedelic. There's also a lot of heavy noise sections um, and like, bedroom pop vocals um <laughs> and then since i'd say 2016 i've been pretty pretty regularly releasing albums under my own name um as eric schlappy yeah uh, and that those are the ones that we can find on bandcamp right i think you can find all this stuff i would recommend probably the the eric schlappy stuff over well, I don't know. It's all it's all interesting. Yeah. But I mean, let me just post yeah. that to the companion channel so everyone is able to uh, to find that as well. So you have something to listen to later on. <laughs> and that that stuff sort of evolved. Um, uh, started off as like heavy monosynth, uh, kind of like industrial monosynth uh, worship. I would play. Um, uh, well, I was <laughs> in between all these bands. I played in another band called Glitterbeard, which I don't think you can find record of in Glitterbeards, Tucson. Glitterbeards, Glitterbeards. I think but, I, I've seen I've seen some some videos of uh, people with glitter in their beards, but I'm not sure if that would be the same. It was uh, like improvisational noise slash doom metal wearing cloaks. Uh, pretty <laughs> lots of fog <laughs> machines but we ended up with uh we ended up with lots of cloaks and when i started doing my solo stuff again i had lots of tube amps and cloaks and um uh yeah my partner and some friends uh wow. um, helped me with some uh some rituals some synthesizer rituals hmm <laughs> superb I love that, and it's all it's all it's all coming from that same, um, well, doom approach. The, the the whole I would almost go as far as would you would you, would you have um, classified that as uh, as goth or gothic back then? Uh, oh, that's complicated. Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. That's why I wanted to ask you because. I, um, I, 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 I've, I've had a similar, um, I've, I've had similar stories when I was playing in metal bands as well, where people immediately uh, pressed the label "gothic" uh, on you every time you wore all black, but um, and, uh, and any time you did something theatrical. And I knew that at that time I was a bit well frustrated with everything just being classified as goth. So that's why I wanted to ask you if you were self uh, classifying or. Uh, it is I that. think the one the one I usually get is noise guy. Um, I don't. <laughs> I think no matter what I I think I'm doing, people have a tendency to classify it as noise. I rarely agree with this classification because that's um, what you do. Well, but no, I don't because there's like because I've heard real noise. Like I think the people that are calling me a noise guy don't know. You know mm -hmm. they don't. Uh, I like noise shows. I like, um, uh, yeah, I like it when someone goes up and shreds the speakers and screams and breaks everything. I don't necessarily listen to it always at home, but like in live shows. Yeah, absolutely. That is absolutely the best. Um, mm-hmm. I have uh, some friends in Portland who are really, really good at it. Uh, my friend uh, Derek and Lo, uh, I think uh, Derek's usually goes under. Uh, he has a noise label called um, Unseen Force, and he has a number of projects. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Fleisch, I think, is the main one, but 
that's that's real noise um i'm not i'm not real noise i'm just a synth nerd <laughs> and there is no shame in that absolutely but i i do recognize what you say when you uh, noise or uh, some of those lo-fi um genres and i i typically look at mid 90s uh scandinavian black metal and the really lo-fi stuff that you can find there i love to see that played live because of the the drone and the same well the, that same appreciation you've got for uh noise being played live and i think that that's something that well, we, we, we were unable to um, to really experience that during lockdown, of course, but still it's it's great to uh, to wait until we can finally do that again. Yeah, hearing something like that, like even metal, I think, rarely gets there. Like a lot of the time metal people are just, um, you know, they're they're focused on their instruments. They're playing their parts, but mm -hmm. there <laughs> there isn't always that much energy there. Sometimes there is. Yeah, but like a really good noise performance, the uh, the energy can really take over a room, can really scrub your brain totally raw, and uh, absolutely, yeah. I miss uh, it. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully uh, by the end of this year we're finally able to go out and about, of course, and um, uh, as most of the people probably uh, listening to this. I can't wait to uh, finally be able to uh, go to Berlin for a super booth this year, uh, which will be my first time, by the way. So that's uh, that's always good. Um, but just to go a bit further back into time, so uh, you were studying to be an engineer. You were still having that that dream to uh, finally pick up a um, uh, something where you could actually build your own synths. Um, but when did that point in time actually begin? When did you finally uh, say, okay, well now this is this is the time for me to really make sure that I'm gonna start building synthesizers myself, or at least modules in your case, of course. Um, I think so. I was always always trying to build synths. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they worked a lot better once I'd you know had a couple years of <laughs> engineering experience under my belt um but the eurorack thing i think <laughs> i still feel like i got into it late but that was more than <laughs> seven years ago <laughs> maybe eight years ago now um and uh one of the great things about eurorack and i think one of the reasons it's so um i think it's something we might actually be losing soon but it's it's an achievable goal right like you can one person uh by themselves with no money can uh realistically design a module even in spare time after work can mm -hmm. realistically uh design and manufacture a module it might take a long time but it's not something you need a team to do um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some of the things that we're we're reaching a level of uh, things getting a lot more complicated now, where it really helps to have a team. Mm -hmm. And why but, is that? Could you could you elaborate a bit more on that? Um. So if you look at the designs that were um, coming out in twenty fourteen, uh, yeah, we had like a lot of. There was a lot. Of <laughs> Anything that was done in the '70s, you can probably do layout like there. You know, there's it's just a few chips. You can maybe even do it through hole, right? Like it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, if you breadboard one of these older designs, and even if you don't fully understand it, you don't even need to do the math necessarily. If you can kind of get it to work, understand mm -hmm. it enough to get it to work and tweak it. You can yeah. probably make something cool, and uh, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, the stuff that was coming out there. <laughs> then a lot was often through hole, and um, you know, it's, people were charging some pretty ridiculous money for something that's just a couple of op amps. Um, though, I, you know, that's it's difficult assigning 
value to circuits like this. But um, mm -hmm. and there were some people coming up with some really clever variations too. Like I, some of the stuff that really inspired me was uh, 4MS with the um, yeah. noise swash. Uh, there and you know actually they're a really great example. Like they started off um, kind of bringing in these strange um, designs that had been pedals and noise boxes that they'd been making forever back when they were 3ms um <laughs> and uh now they're making these really complex really uh really refined modules like the um well i've got the dld in my rack and i was mm -hmm. you know the ensemble loss that they came out with last year seems really great like and they've kind of at this point polished everything to a pretty bright sheen and things like that are uh you know they i'm not saying dan couldn't do it by himself <laughs> but it it helps to have have a team like he's got um i think he's doing all the i can't really speak for dan but like um you know it's nice to have a dsp expert you can call in if you're doing a digital module and yeah i I find it like I'm getting into some digital stuff. Um, and even as I'm just scaling up with the analog stuff and making it more manufacturable, it's, uh, it, um, you know, at each step you make the thing that you can make, uh, having gone to super booth. So this next time will be my fourth time at super booth. Great. Um, and I don't know, uh, been to, um all these other <laughs> a few of these other things and hanging out with actually hanging out in portland was really important because um a lot of the people there have really like figuring this stuff out so another thing about having a team like if you work for a company mm -hmm. uh, if you hit a problem that you can't figure out you um like working for a large engineering firm you go and you talk to your boss and you say, I can't figure this out. Help and me, either yeah. your boss, <laughs> you say, help me. And your boss knows, <laughs> like, if you're just sitting there banging your head against the wall, you're wasting a significant <laughs> amount of money. <laughs> um, so he, uh, you know, he get he finds the gray hair, the gray beards in the basement uh, uh, or whatever, you know, he finds one of the senior engineers and he lets you, uh, or, you know, they... They let you pick their mm -hmm. brain for an hour or two, and they don't give you all the solutions, but... Um, You'll have that second line of support there, of course, yeah. You keep going. If you're if you're by yourself trying to figure this stuff out, like, the stuff on the internet is mostly wrong, and looking at DIY stuff is... Like, don't look at DIY designs from 10 years ago. They're bad. Mm -hmm. um, what's really helpful... Uh, are white papers from Texas Instruments and the analog designs, especially the ones from the 80s, yeah. which are more reflective of the kind of technology that we use when we're talking about audio than modern stuff. But uh, but wading through all this stuff is hard, and when you're trying to use app notes from the 80s but adapt them to modern production techniques, um, uh, you're unless you have a community to help you out, you're probably just going to slam your head against the wall over yeah. and over and over. And in in that regard, uh, just always a quick question, uh, being a physicist, one of the, the most practical documents or, or pieces of reference material I found was the, the art of electronics. Uh, but is that still relevant for synth designers nowadays? I probably, oddly, I've never found that book useful. Um, I know... I know it is. Uh, I've, I've found it useful once or twice, but I've never I've never gelled with it. Um, mm -hmm. For me, the most useful books. Uh, there's this thing written by um, put out by Analog Devices in I think the first time was in the late 70s, uh, called the Nonlinear Circuits Handbook, and I found that immensely useful. You will find most synth circuits in there. Um, there's also, of course, it's getting harder to find, but the, um, it's called synth notes. Uh, there's a, 
a newsletter that you could buy for a long time um, mm -hmm. of classic synth designs, but that one was hard for me because it uh, there's too much stuff in there. Like you open it up and you just get lost in possibilities. But um, yeah, the uh, nonlinear circuits handbook and um, uh, there's a famous um, another guy who worked for analog devices in the 70s um, Walt uh, he has a it's it's called the op amp handbook something generic like that and it's kind of frustrating because the modern versions aren't they keep releasing books with the same title but at this point they're pretty useless and all of his <laughs> like good uh, good circuits are gone well they're paved over with more modern circuits and yeah but um what's it called it's I, the op amp op applications amp. handbook would that be it that might be uh is it the one that's by walt young you want the version yeah, that young, clearly yeah. states it's by walt young yeah that's this um, one this is edited by walt young from 2005 so that's not the one you want okay <laughs> you want the one that's uh from like the 70s or 80s that's uh just by walt young and uh i think it's called the same thing and it's or something very similar and it's kind of annoying to find but um the internet anything, will set you free <laughs> <laughs> anything written by walt young i find there's like a certain certain people uh, certain technical writers that I really gel with. Walt Young had a very, he, he has a very practical take. He'll he'll hit you with the math, but yeah. um, I found those books really useful. Um, yeah, there's there's lots of others. I'm sort of obsessive about textbooks. I've uh, coming to France has been hard because I had to leave all my textbooks in a storage in Portland, and mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time not buying another st stack of them i can imagine but nowadays of course with all of everything being available electronically that might be well i mean i can you can find most of not all of the things but you can find most of them electronically but mm -hmm. i don't i don't want that i want to lay in a bed physical with piece a... of paper that you can <laughs> yeah. touch and work with and and underline and highlight if you want <laughs> <laughs> and every time I go, like, this happens to me over and over and over. When I want to know something, I'll, like, you know, I'm trained by the Internet. So I go I go to the Internet, I type it in, and I lose a bunch of time. Uh, every every page that comes up is totally worthless, right? Like, everything on that All About Circuits site is absolutely wrong. Um, everything <laughs> on, like, Stack Exchange is wrong. Some of the stuff results coming up from, uh, like old like electro music and muff wiggler stuff is useful but like not all of it is and then so i'll waste a bunch of time looking at all this garbage on the internet and then realize that i already bought the textbook and that it's six feet behind me and i just need to pick it up and the answer is there <laughs> absolutely uh, i can imagine absolutely and that's the, that's the beauty of course and especially if you're schooled in, in engineering where uh, a lot of the um, the synth newcomers might be I might even call that classically trained in electronic engineering um, where they do have to depend on sources like um, like all about circuits or indeed the the information that they get from uh, from 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 well maybe designs from the 80s or 70s and that's of course another thing um, but as, I mean, as said, yeah unfortunately the information from the 70s and 80s is often what you want because you know audio is old text so mm -hmm. uh when <laughs> when people were uh innovating with this stuff like a lot of these things um you know um like granular synthesis and this stuff that's oh, yeah. buzzwords now physical modeling like people are still mostly as far as i know still mostly going off of sources from the 80s it's just yep. it never it never made its way into a commercial product back then but that's when the research was done yeah and now finally 
the the computational power is available in small enough units where so i've been yeah i've i've i've, I've been in contact with some of the authors back then about uh great well spe specifically uh, uh granular synthesis and that was uh in this case that was what's the person's name again uh, Professor Curtis Rhodes, yeah, <laughs> Curtis Rhodes, yeah, absolutely. I've been I've been exchanging some emails with him, specifically about that point where I'm like, okay, well, how is this all? How has this all come together? And how we now see a lot of these um, uh, granular modules and also granular being applied into more of the standalone synthesizers nowadays. How this has how has all of that come come about and why is now a big thing even though well you literally wrote the book on this uh, a couple of decades ago what i think i mean what what has he said actually before i start rambling let me see what he said i'm just looking at his emails i still need to make sure that he's uh, on this uh um so he's um blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he, he recommended me to make sure that I would look, I would read up on microsound and uh, have a look at the granularsynthesis.com website. And yeah, most of the information and most of the questions I had were there. So that's, yeah. So um, <laughs> granularsynthesis.com, that's the uh, the website that he, uh, that, he, that he maintains. So I'm not familiar with that one. But, well, it's, um, it's, it's not it's not his website. I, I, apologies for that, but it's one of the websites that talks a, a lot about the um, the core principles within that. So it's I've just pasted the link to uh, the companion channel. Oh, I got you. Yeah, there's um, uh, so another good uh, one of the obvious references for all the DSP stuff is the Julius's uh, Orion Smith. Have you dug into that? I haven't yet, so Julius so he, haven't. Julius uh J O S you might find it as, but uh Julius Orion Smith. Um he wrote a bunch of really good textbooks which are also uh online yeah. uh for free. And he's worked with uh he goes back really far in the um computer like the computer music research world he's worked with uh hopefully i'm not saying things wrong but i think he worked with max matthews back in the day oh, um, nice. uh, so he goes uh anyway that stuff's all really useful um and he's one nice thing about his writings is he's really good at um including references to papers that mm -hmm. are good um and then you know, you can just go to Sci-Hub and track them all down. <laughs> and then you but, get into another uh, rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> but how did this all evolve into you, well, I, I, I suppose pulling the trigger and say, okay, I'm going to do synth design and PCB design and uh, on the one hand freelancing, but also uh, releasing your own modules full time. How did that come about? Oh, um, yeah, so... I think 2014, after I started uh, getting in, like I got into Eurorack and uh, bought a bunch of PCBs and started building them and then started nice. uh, playing with what would become the Interstellar Radio, um, which kind of comes from, uh, oh whole different like non-synth world of um strange uh, <laughs> 80s application notes that i dug into in some of my uh, freelance work but mm -hmm. yeah i uh <laughs> after after college i took the only engineering job i could get which don't particularly want to talk about but yeah. it did uh it did allow me to get a pretty cool, um, which took me to Tucson, Arizona, which was pretty awesome. Um, yeah. And it allowed me to uh, get some freelance like, contract work, which was really cool because, um, you know, some people have better luck with big, big engineering companies than me, but 
-hmm. they they don't let you <laughs> they m might not let you uh move very quick or <laughs> yeah they, or they, 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 they won't let you go that easily no absolutely not <laughs> whereas the um if you're working freelance or contract um you know depending on how you're working for like they you know they, it's just go 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 do everything as quick as you can learn what you can um and yeah. uh yeah and and also you know they they may not have a requirement for you to be in the office 40 hours or whatever a week um so if you can figure out a way to work you know 30, 30 hours and spend the rest of your time building since <laughs> um, that's great and yeah there was somewhere along the line like i there was a couple years where I thought maybe I just, I just wanted to follow a more engineering, traditional engineering path, and then, mm -hmm. then I remembered that since was, <laughs> was the reason the you singer. started with this, yeah. Yeah, it, you can get lost, but, um, Absolutely. yeah, and then it it just sort of snowballed when we moved to Portland. Um, I met, um, oh. Uh, a man named Thomas Feng, who uh, currently works for 4MS, but he introduced me to a lot of great people that uh, build synthesizers in Portland, and it sort of quickly snowballed, um, getting the first uh, interstellar radio built at Dark Place uh, there, and and making friends who, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> really kind of pushed me forward um and one of them uh my friend uh brandon uh mordax who we actually share space with in portland um introduced me to fpgas and that's where my head's been for a couple years even though i've failed to release anything but i've had a lot of fun um but that's brandon mordax so his full name is brandon fessler right Yes. Okay. Yes. And then I, I was always like, oh, is that his real last name? I always thought it was something different. But yeah. <laughs> and he, uh, yeah, he makes the data. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm still, I'm still drooling over that. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you still, aren't the only one. It's still on my list. Absolutely. Um, but at, at that time, when you were just oh, uh, getting friendly with Forum S and and. and and, and then other people there, you said you already started to design the the, Illus, uh, the interstellar radio. Uh, could you, for those of you, uh, for, the, for the people that are listening who don't know the interstellar radio, could you, well, how would you describe that in just one paragraph? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. I'm, I do apologize for that, Eric. <laughs> um, so it, it, modulates and demodulates the signal with different clock references mm -hmm. um, and you can use this to simulate poor radio reception but when i say that a lot of people think that maybe you can use it for subtle like am fm like uh you know a pro tools plugin that gives you some clicks and pops yeah um when you demodulate an fm signal wrong <laughs> you don't get like subtle clicks and pops you get mm -hmm. um you get more fm so you get um uh waves and waves and waves of complex uh fm and, and so you get all of that superposition um interfering with each other of course yeah well it's so there's um essentially f four oscillators in there um you have uh uh an input signal is modulated onto a high frequency pulse train and then um demodulated within a pll loop so mm -hmm. uh when you modulate something up like that really you're you're using an oscillator um you're you're doing fm on one oscillator 
to bring it up to um because where that circuit actually comes from to back up mm -hmm. is um something i needed in the medical world where you um have uh high voltage <laughs> you have two things with uh <laughs> 10 10 to 30 kilovolts on them oh wow and you need the grounds to not be connected mm, and you want to yeah <laughs> transmit a analog voltage and you you can't because if you're transmitting like an analog voltage has to be a circuit the mm -hmm. ground has to be connected it has to go somewhere and it has to come back um but you can use uh basically use an oscillator to change this voltage into a series of pulses which you can yeah. then send um optically and you know uh an optical signal does not have to be a, a circuit per se it um you can just you know, send you, and receive of course yeah yeah, and that doesn't need to be connected electrically. So, um, but you would lose I'd, some resolution there, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it depends on how fast the oscillator is, right? Yeah, um, yeah of course. Yeah. But uh, any uh, because you, you're actually going from analog to well, digital, of course. Yeah, it's um, so it's that circuit is called a voltage to frequency converter, and they're often used in radio and lots of other things but you can use that as a it is a form of um analog to digital conversion yeah um i've actually got obsessed with all the different types of um crude analog to digital converters out there because <laughs> they're fundamentally an analog to digital converter is an analog device um and they're mm -hmm. all they're pretty fascinating. There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, but that's one of them is you just have, um, if you have an oscillator with a uh, linear voltage control, um, then uh, every, you know, a DC voltage will map to some um, output frequency. And that output frequency can be a square wave and you can, uh, interpret it with uh to fully make it an analog the digital converter you have to um count the pulses somehow yeah and you need some logic to do that but it's not a type of analog the digital converter that's particularly <laughs> efficient or i don't think it's used a lot anymore but it does it does do that thing absolutely so uh, and this was the the, the very first module you designed yourself right yeah i thought that maybe when i um when i took those um this process that up converts and down converts and when i changed the um respective rates that it does this that it would create a, a sort of bit crushing aliasing effect but it really doesn't it's really just stacks of frequency modulation <laughs> but um but i decided i like that i don't uh yeah um i think it's it's not exactly what i had in my mind when i was uh first designing it but i no. decided it was musical and i i think it creates tones that um pretty distinct i don't think i've heard anything else that quite sounds like it so in a way the 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 overall success of the interstellar radio was uh, as they call it in modular synthesis a, a happy little accident for sure but there is um there is a process it's not like you no absolutely uh, yeah. the it's not like you find it makes some weird sounds and then you um and then you and push then you it out it. and I just mean, yeah <laughs> there, there was a principle in at the basis of course of this that there was an overall architecture you were thinking about and then the the actual sound design came out differently than what you expected but the the science was sound <laughs> and there was also a long process of like everything i've released so far has spent you know a year or two in my rack where i jam on it and i tweak it Mm -hmm. um, and try to make it something that's aside from exploring some sort of um, mm -hmm. some sort of uh, theoretical concept it actually 
serves an obvious uh, musical use. I don't, uh, I can get uncomfortable sometimes if people uh, talk too much about what is musical and what isn't musical, but in this case, it was, it's something that I can use in every patch. <laughs> yeah. It's not an edge case. No, and, and and even still, if people try to instill any sort of uh, value to what is music and what is not, uh, it, it always goes back to to the old mantra, and it's all in the eye of the beholder. What I consider music uh, might be different from what you consider music, and vice versa. That, uh, yeah, and I also. One of the things that drew me to Eurorec, um, I mean, I think it's great that the tools have gotten better and make people are able to make something that sounds like polished music mm -hmm. with Eurorec. But that is much less interesting to me <laughs> than people making <laughs> uh, totally insane alien bloop boops. Um, and for a while, it was like every modular show I went to I loved because it was all insane and now people are <laughs> able to make music with it and you know sometimes I like music and sometimes it you know I don't but then know. it gets back 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 to the, the to the old thing um, when it is becoming a bit more polished then it comes into the realm of uh, what kind of genre do you like do you like the the more techno approach do you like the more hip hoppy approach do you like the more this this or that approach as where it was well, as <laughs> in your words the more bleep and bloops uh, then it was more generic where you might say well the, the overall catch all term for it would just be this is modular and yeah and exactly and overall and I think for a period that um by pure coincidence coincided with my taste in what I like to hear, especially live. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's like, overall, it's a good thing that people can make what's there in their head and not forced by the tools to make insane alien freakouts. But I do really like insane alien freakouts. <laughs> as you should, as you should. Uh, so c could you tell me a bit about what the... Um well, I would almost say the market's response was to the interstellar radio, but I might want to rephrase that to what the community thought of the interstellar radio. Because at that time, you were, of course, already well, entrenched within the uh, the modular community, I might say. Well, I, so I, I'd basically finished that by the time I got to Portland and mm -hmm. I got to meet other people. Because in Tucson, there were not... not <laughs> There were a couple of people with modular synths. There's there's some deep heads there, but <laughs> I wouldn't say that I really interacted with the community until I got to um, Portland. But okay. I people people still buy it. People still use it. Um, yeah, I don't know that um, that was just like you have to. <laughs> you can't always guide your your muse and. And your, you know, your technical skills are, are you know, you have to make what you can with what you have. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I moved on. Uh, it's I wouldn't say, um, you know, it's it's not a smash hit, but it continues to steadily sell, and I think that's kind of. Like all of my modules are mm -hmm. maybe not aimed straight down the middle, but the people that discover them um, seem to get what I'm trying to put out there, and I really appreciate that. Um, That's right. The the after that was the angle grinder, which is an even more confusing one to explain to people, but it can do quite a few things. Um, the 100 grit is a little bit easier since I think people understand like uh, dis uh, distortion and filtering and touch points, even if uh, the way that one's put together is pretty mm -hmm. original, I think. Um, Absolutely. But the, <laughs> but the basic functionality is maybe a little uh, 
like a the use case is a little more traditional um and uh the boundary also as i i really appreciate the the video you did the other day because it um you you got from the really obvious uses to uh and to some of the less obvious stuff like the using it as a compressor but oh, thank um you. I would I would say you can even go further like oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you can actually use that as a you could use it as a sample and hold you can use it as a wave shaper and that's the beauty of, of, of function generators there is so much to them it is absolutely <laughs> great and I as I, as I said so uh, I was I was working on that video and I'm like well I'm never going to be able to do this in a 30 minute video and then I just I just bit the bullet and I said, okay, well, I'm going to do a longer video because I think the actual video is already, let me just double check that, um, how long it is, because I typically try to make my videos um, 30 minutes long tops, but I do seem to get, the more and more I, I come to understand all of the basic principles, my videos are just getting longer and longer over time. And I'm like, well, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I would like to give the <laughs> the community. And then, of course, I, I but I do want to do justice to some of the gear I'm I'm looking at. So uh, let me just double check that. So currently, that's that first video on the boundary is 31 minutes. Uh, but I I was working on it, and I'm like, okay, well, now I'm writing something that is more going towards two hours. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I need to cut this down and I need to um, do a couple of introductory things. I do need to show a bit more of the uh, the advanced stuff, but I do want to make a really nerdy, in-depth, um, all, all uh, gloves are off and we can really dive and get dirty into it. So I'm, I'm going to save that for later, absolutely. <laughs> But as you said, so w w once you designed the the Illust uh, interstellar radio, then you got into the 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 angle grinder, and then after that the the hundred grits, and now back to the to the boundary, of course. Um, one of the questions we did get in the companion channel is overall um, that there is a very distinct uh, aesthetic to your modules. Um, do you have any any sort of rules or mantras? Uh, into that actual design of, on the one hand, the faceplate, but also the user interface and the um, module as a whole. Well, it needs to be playable. I mm -hmm. don't... For me, I keep wondering if I'm missing something because I keep, you know, there's all these... <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, these modules that to me seem like they'd be difficult to play. For me, I've... I've done revs where like I'm I'm not immune from the um like of course I want to make everything as small as I can and as dense as I can but I found like a hard limit for me with my knobs is about an inch apart any closer and it's not like the the whole point of the modular for me is to be a live instrument like yeah you need to be able to play it so you need to be able to get your fingers in there so the knobs have to be at least an inch apart. They need to be big. They need to feel good. Um, all of the jacks need to be on the bottom and away from the knobs because you got to plug stuff into those jacks and you got to wiggle the knobs. And you can't do that <laughs> if they're all interspersed. Um, and uh, aside from that, it's it's not like it's it's always evolving. I don't. The longer I play it, the more opinions I have, but I'm not I'm not stuck on <laughs> on anything. Each <laughs> each each module will continue to be different. Yeah. And it's gonna be yeah, I'm I'm just curious to see what's gonna be next for you as well. Uh because as as you explain that whole journey that you go through uh, where you say, okay, I'm going to get a something like a prototype. I'm going to test drive that uh, for, well, you mentioned something like at least six months. And I'm like, okay, well, that, that, that does, that does translate into very dependable and very well-designed modules, I think. 
I mean, that's that's the hope. They they at least fit my workflow. Like they all, mm -hmm. um, you know, I. For me, it's like I. <laughs> I think in some ways I'm not very disciplined. If I'm not playing music, I find it hard to focus on this stuff. Like if I don't want it in my rack, I, I've i abandoned quite a few modules along the way, actually, even though I've found them to be interesting, uh, I wasn't keeping them in my rack. And like, I'm making toys for myself. Mm -hmm. So if, if I, if I don't always want it in my rack, I don't understand why I'd go through the effort why it someone else would like um and i also have trouble with the motivation to um to make something if i'm not making a toy for myself <laughs> <laughs> but because that is of course the intri intrinsic driving force of course we we're all at our core we're all still kids wanting a a better toy of course yeah, and you know you can you can dress it up. Yeah. Um, I I do like to think that there is um, that they open up a certain palette that's maybe not not unobtainable in other ways, but more difficult to get to. I think I <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um. But that is, of yeah, course, my... again. But that, 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 and I, I totally understand that. Uh, where you say you want to build um, modules for for the niche within a niche within a niche. Where you say, if you want to do something really out of the ordinary, and if you want to have the tools to achieve that, then here you have a collection or a selection of the tools that you might want to use. Yeah, I. <laughs> uh, you did a great interview with uh, my friend Ross Fish the other week. Oh, he's great. Uh, he was a gr uh, absolutely great guy. I ha have, I have not laughed as hard as during that interview for a long time, and I uh, that was great, absolutely. And yeah, he's uh, he's pretty amazing, but um, he did say something probably more succinctly than I would put it but um, he talked about how if you or maybe I'd put it slightly different but yeah. if you make something and you have the internet out there like you don't if if you're keeping your if you're not trying to build a giant company and you're not trying to um, you know start up a business or whatever but you're just trying to do what you want to do yeah. Um, you can probably make whatever it is you want, and there are people out there who want it, and you don't, you don't have to tailor it to other people because you're not a unique snowflake, and other people will want the same things, probably. That's quite philosophical, and I like that. I I, I do. <laughs> well, and it 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 it. it, it the the immediate um association that um that that will actually bring forth within me is that the actual design of, of modules or especially how you approach it is more like 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 an artist a painter a Someone like Andy Warhol would say, well, this is my design. I'm going to create a limited amount of them. And it does refer back to what, or, uh, what Ross was talking about last week, uh, where he said, I'm just going to do an X amount of these, and that's it. I'm never going to do it again. This is it. And well, then... I the actually, yeah. Well, so I actually have some... I've talked about this with some people... I don't love the idea of, so I think it is half an art project. Yeah. But the limited thing bums me out because not not in Ross's yeah. case, but in some cases it leads to um, artificial scarcity. Yeah. Art, yeah, you're like putting something on a pedestal, and I mean I think Ross is 
Ross is probably right in this case as far as like a business case goes cuz yeah like if you're making super weird stuff it, I I am sometimes running into issues as I as I make more things like it is it's a real pain when uh you suddenly have to buy faceplates for a bunch of different modules that will sell slowly over the next year when you really need the money to make something new so that that's yeah. frustrating but I do I do like the idea of everything being affordable and obtainable and um, kind of an art piece, but also utilitarian in its own way. Yeah, and I think that's the... Well, and I think that uh, Russ is on one of the um, extremes on, on that spectrum. And, I, and, and, as, and as you said, I totally understand where that's coming from. In his case, absolutely. Um, uh, where you have the the more commoditized and utilitarian uh, approach to module making on the other side of the spectrum, and I think that that is that's something one of the things that I truly like about your rack. You can find anything across that spectrum, and um, anyone who is building something, anyone who is creating something anyone that's designing or or programming something uh will be probably be be be, be commemorates it in the years to come because it'll end up in the hands of uh, a couple of enthusiasts who are gonna spend years and years and years to create great or less great kind of music uh, or or sounds with that and i think that that's great about the whole community absolutely perfect and that's the hope. That's 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 a good reason to do this. Absolutely. So, uh, for, for just from a from a from a from a numbers perspective, um, if you look back at the uh, at the modules you currently have, uh, which would actually be the most popular one in your current lineup? It's the hundred grit. Still, oh well, that's that's great. And there. Uh, yeah, wow. Almost a thousand of those in the world now. Not Jeez, wow. Not not high, you know, we're not talking maths or data's or clouds, but I feel pretty proud of that. I can imagine absolutely. That's a great achievement, absolutely brilliant. Congrats. A thousand of those. And if you then uh, I I saw a a Facebook post uh a while back where people were uh, trying to calculate the number of Eurorack users out there in the world. And I think that uh, they, they, they base that on a couple of things like the, the number of subscribers to DivKid and the, the people that were subscribed to, uh, to Mort Wiggler uh, and those kind of things. And that estimate was, if I'm remembering correctly, approximately 100,000 people worldwide. So if you can then say that one in a hundred would have your module in their rack. That's great. That's fantastic. I think, I think the number is way higher than that. I I thought so too, but I I, I couldn't find I couldn't find any sort of um, uh, actual well. I couldn't find any anything flawed in their logic, but I I would assume as well that the the number would be much higher. But it's we're we're not talking about half a billion people or something. No, no. It's I think order of magnitude. I think it's right, but I think I think the number is higher. But I think one thing I've thought about a bit recently is because my my entry point to this was this. Um, you know, it was the the unfortunately named forum, which is <laughs> was the unfortunately <laughs> named forum and is now named Mod Wiggler. Um, so I, sometimes I, I, I make I, I I might I I'm doing all the best I can to uh, to make sure that I'm only using the new name. And even though I'm I'm an actual absolute newbie in this community, I still sometimes mess up. And I do have to apologize if I've done that in this recording as well. <laughs> so sometimes I make I make the mistake of thinking that what I see on there represents the community at large, but. From talking to different um, different manufacturers, mm -hmm. uh, it absolutely doesn't. Like uh, absolutely. any internet 
forum you look at, any Facebook group, uh, it's always none the vocal of these minority. things. It's yeah, it's it not. I don't I don't know how you try to get an overall. Like I think people who would really have the data would be um, some of these big stores, like um, yeah. I don't know, Perfect Circuit or uh, Schneider's Laden or something. I think I think they might. They yeah. might know, but um, but I don't know how else you'd find this sort of thing out. But yeah. it absolutely like it's not a not a monolithic community, and there are, there are lots of people I think that uh, play with modular synths that don't nerd out on the internet about it. And oh, you... absolutely, absolutely. I have to remember uh, that. No, uh, and you're absolutely right. Where um, we might be considered the vocal minority because we're active on social media, we are reaching out to uh, to respect it uh, makers like yourself and there is of course a a, a silent min uh, majority that's actually just doing the best they can with it and just enjoying it and and that's great and there's nothing wrong with that of course and that's of course one of the things where i'm like okay well how do we want to make sure that we we cater to those as well that's <laughs> That's and, and not, not, not from a, not from a commercial point of view, uh, but um, uh, so 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 as you know, I've, 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 as I said, I'm quite new to this overall game, and I've been um, I've been really lucky about all the the, the support and the input and the and the and the advice I've got, but I'm always thinking about that that sole person who is in in their attic or in their in their studio who is not part of the the active community and who is actively just creating the most awesome bleeps and bloops that we will probably never hear and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we can make sure that those people are are able to share all of their great um, creations on the one hand but also to express what they would need to feed their uh, creative juices even further I mean my answer which is probably the wrong one but is to not try and think <laughs> just do <laughs> try not to have any other just do the thing you think is awesome and hope that mm -hmm. that a because trying to predict people yeah absolutely that's yeah hard. and don't make assumptions <laughs> yeah don't make assumptions don't don't you know um i'm not trying to close it off from people that's exactly the opposite i just think if i make assumptions about what people want then they're going to be wrong yeah. um and i'm going to alienate more people than i find so the you know the best way to you know, you just <laughs> you know, you go to trade shows and stuff, and that's great. Yeah. But you know, not everyone goes to trade shows. Um, Again, it's just a representation of a a small selection of people within the demographic, so to say. So I, yeah, I have. I just try and remind myself that, you know, I guess this is more like a general life thing, but like. <laughs> it's hard because I I'm a know-it-all nerd, um, <laughs> but aren't we reminding old? myself <laughs> that I don't know it all and I'm probably wrong and I can't speak for other people. But you still do your best, right? I still do my best. You can't you can't <laughs> let that shut you down. Absolutely, you have to oh, remind great. yourself. But like you know, so then you have. Or at least for me, it's like, okay, well, you know, just <laughs> <laughs> you still, you know, talk to your friends and stuff, but try and to get, just and make get the their thing down to earth feedback and make sure that they keep your, your feet on the ground. And yeah, absolutely. Um, so also, I, 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 I know, asked you for a, a 30 minute interview and we're like, how long, almost an hour and 15, sorry, an hour and almost 20 minutes down the line. 
uh, and we haven't even oh, yeah. opened it up to uh, to the rest of the audience. Um, so, um, what I'd like to do is, I, I still have two questions for you, and then we're going to open sure. it up for the for the audience, um, if that's all right. Yeah. So, um, my first question would be, if you were to go back to that to that teen who was experiencing death metal and was looking for the the best the, the 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 most gruesome the most extreme and all of those kind of things where 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 where, where, where he was just exploring his, uh, his palette of tastes if you were to give them uh, give give him one piece of advice regarding since your rack whatever engineering even what would that piece of advice be <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> i don't know i'd probably try and send them a list of the the good textbooks so they don't <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, accompany it with a list of all the uh, the chips he needs to stock up on before uh, 2019 happens. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. You can waste a lot of time on uh, on garbage on the internet. Oh yeah, but, absolutely. But you know, the journey's half of it, I guess, right? Ah, oh yeah, truly, truly. I th I I do think that if I was uh, if I got into synths earlier in my life, I wouldn't have been as motivated as I am right now to do all the things that I do currently. So no, I I, I totally understand that. Yeah. Uh, but still, just making sure that you are looking into that that knowledge sharing, and especially, and one of the things that I'll remember from this interview is, uh, the comments you made about where we are losing a lot of the knowledge that we as a as a community or maybe even as the human race in general that we are forgetting uh, ever since the late 70s and early 80s uh, when it comes to circuit design uh, because of all the things that, are, that were abundantly available for us during the 90s uh, and, and 2010s and early 2020s, uh, which are currently, of course, being impacted by all the uh, the IC shortages. Um, that's something oh, I'm well, going to look into. I don't, I don't know if I... It's... I, I don't know if I... It's hard to make things right now. It, it totally sucks. Yeah. I can't even buy it. A T O seventy four in in the package that I usually use, which is the tiny little T softs. But you can buy T O seventy fours if you're willing to use older, more obsolete packages. So I, oh, all wow. that yeah. stuff is lost. It's it's harder to find. I think you'll actually see a lot of a lot more analog uh, stuff coming out in the next year or so because um, you know finding the op amp sucks right now, but yeah. finding uh, did you, an STM32 or an FPGA is a lot worse. <laughs> so, I that stuff's not lost. It's harder. It's not really taught in schools anymore. Uh, yeah. And it's it's you really have to go. You really have to search for it. And the signal to noise ratio on the internet is pretty bad. You really you really shouldn't unless it says like analog devices or Texas Instruments on it like. <laughs> <laughs> I love that analogy where you say signal to noise ratio on internet. I think that that should be something that we teach the younger generation about, okay, signal to noise ratio on the internet. I love that. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> That's all about filtering out the uh <laughs> the wrong kind of things. Um, it's yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, uh, one of the things that um, I'm always looking into is, of course, I've been I've been given this chance to, 
well, over the course of almost an, an hour and a half, and I, again, I apologize, Eric. I've been able to ask you anything uh, that I wanted to know. And again, I want to thank you for that. But I do want to return the favor. So my last question is typically, what would be your question to me? Oh, have you read any good comic books lately? <sighs> comic books, that's a good question. Um, not really. I, I don't, I haven't had any chance to read any comic books. Uh, so my, um, the one thing is we, we get this weekly comic book from, 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 from the Disney company. Uh, it's a periodical called Donald Duck that we get here. And my, and, and, and the typical thing is that this is, this is kind of a, well, you might al almost call it a ritual within Dutch families that the eldest child uh, will get a subscription to the Donald Duck weekly comic book and that is going way beyond anything that the Walt Disney Company as a whole ever ever ever, ever thought about but it is going into all kinds of um, newsworthy things um, and that could be local information right here in the Netherlands but could also be global things going on and I'm always surprised at the level of localization that that periodical Disney um, branded comic book can push out and how it handles uh, current takes I haven't uh, so my, my son he told me that there was actually a a comic about corona and, and, and the whole pandemic and I'm like well that's absolutely fantastic because it's 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 aimed towards these pre-teens so my eldest he's seven um, and it's it's absolutely fantastic. So if you ever have a chance to get your hands on some Dutch Donald Ducks, I would I would I would recommend you do that. Uh, but you might want to use the well the inline translation capabilities built in within the whatever phone you're using. Um, otherwise, while you're in France, I will recommend you to read all of the asterisk. Uh, comic books by um, Hergé. Those are absolutely great, and 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 they those have been translated into any sort of language, even if into Latin. I'm not uh, if I'm not mis mistaken. Let me just see how that's called in English. Even I I am aware of them. They are they are ever present. I need they are yes. I'm. My attempts to learn French so far have been pretty poor, but uh, I fully intend to read as many Asterix and Obelisk comics as I can. Yeah, Asterix le, Gaul le Gaulois. Mais bien sûr, mon ami, ce n'est pas de problème. <laughs> mm. Parler français, c'est très compliqué <laughs> pour moi, néerlandais, mais. Well, I'm just going to stop it right there. I've, 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 I've embarrassed myself way too much. So we do need to. So we are educated in in Dutch, French, German, English, and if you are um, if you're in the well upper percentiles, you also get Latin and Ancient Greek. And I'm like, okay, well, and then we've we've got people here in the Netherlands that speak Spanish or even other languages and I'm like wow I'm so impressed by that and then I think I'm, I'm I'm only quite passable in English and Dutch and then well I can I can have a well <laughs> a holiday conversation in German and French and there are so many people out there that speak 10 or 20 languages and I'm like wow I'm so impressed it's, uh, me too it's, it's 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 and i think that asterisk is of course one of the great things where you can just take two editions side by side and just read them and that's one of the the things we did as as uh, as kids as well where we had a french and a dutch one side by side that was that was great awesome. um but again i digress but that's a great question um and i do want to thank you for that uh, eric um 
before we open it up, any any um, any any uh, closing statements, any thoughts that we haven't touched upon? Oh, I don't know, but I see I see that Graham, who was on the uh, podcast oh, yeah, the here. other week, who's a friend of mine, is in the. Uh, I see him out there. Oh, hi, Graham. I'm just I've just invited Graham to uh, to join on the stage. I've been working with uh, with Graham for well, he was one of the first people within the community uh, that, that helped me out. So he he's a great guy. Hey, Graham, how are you? Hello. Everything okay? You hear me? I'm on my phone, so I'm not sure how the sound quality is. It's absolutely brilliant. You've got a, a tremendous bass to your voice, even. I'm actually glad that comes through. It doesn't always do that. <laughs> how have you been? Well enough. Good to hear that. Good to hear that. So I uh, I just dragged you up on stage um, because of the well because of Eric. Uh, telling, telling. Well, okay. Well, we we see Graham here in the audience as well. So, um, well, Eric, what would be your question to Graham? <laughs> well, I would ask him how the modules are going, but then we'd have to have a long technical conversation. <laughs> um, you seen any good metal lately? <laughs> uh. You know, actually, I did come across something not long ago, but now I can't place what it was. That's frustrating. <laughs> have you have you guys looked into Eskimo Callboy? No. Okay. If you're into metal, and if you're in, and if you've got an open mind, you really, truly, and unequivocally need to look into Eskimo Callboy. These guys are German, the good kind of German, and they take metal to the extreme, and they want to compete in the Eurovision Song Contest and represent Germany. <laughs> so it's 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 through the roof, and these guys are absolutely crazy. Let me just see if I what would be the best link I could change I could I, I could put on the channel I could do well let's just do the Eskimo Callboy YouTube channel that's probably like the best there is um, no stop it stop it don't play don't play so that's that's one of the things I I truly like and otherwise I uh, I, I, I do have to say I'm, I'm of course uh, quite privy to uh, to Karach Ankern. I think I sent that to you uh, a while ago, Eric. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> that oh no is because of the Eskimo Cowboy clip you're that watching, or yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's um, it's 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 over the top, and I like it. <laughs> I'll have to, yeah, I I I dug some of the the stuff you sent me was a little core for me, like um like it had uh what's the word? It was yeah a li a little main a little too poppy for my taste. This one, the uh, the the Karahangren, or the uh, the one I sent you a while back. The yeah, the ones you sent me on the um, on the Instagram. I appreciate yeah, yeah, yeah. it, but a little little poppy. Okay, well then now I know what you're looking for. I know exactly what I'm going to be uh, sending your way later on. <laughs> no worries. Um, I I I'm gonna I'm gonna get into the more noisy uh, black metal probably. I have you heard uh one thing that like cuz I posted on Instagram about metal bands and I got I got swamped. I got like I can never I don't have enough years in my life to listen to all the <laughs> metal people sent me. But a bunch of people sent me this band Plebeian Grandstand which is like a French uh grindcore band. Um 
I was pretty impressed with that stuff. Oh, wow. That sounds great. Rien ne suffit. That's that's it. That is that is a brutal record. Let's see what that is. I'm I'm just looking at, into it. Um, no, I, I can't. Yeah, I, I, uh, for the interest of the YouTube recording, I won't play any music on the on the recording. But I'm gonna <laughs> listen to that later on. No worries. But I'm always looking for those great kind of things. So whether it's it's extreme punk or extreme metal, I love that. Um, so as I said, I, I did want to open this up to the uh, to the overall audience. Uh, if if anyone has any questions for Eric, for Graham, for for me, uh, just let me know. Um, Christian already mentioned. This is funny. I see a line to Alestorm there. Well, yeah, Alestorm is of course a bit similar to uh, what uh, Eskimo Cowboy is doing in the way that they take metal to the extreme and really make sure it's something that sh truly shows the fun of making these the, the these kind of songs and playing this kind of the this kind of music absolutely brilliant absolutely yeah so um oh, oh there we go where are we um so please as always pl please raise your hand if you've got any questions to ask uh, here live and otherwise just post them in the uh, companion channel so while we have uh, Graham here on the line as well, so Graham, how are the uh, the new modules being received currently? Um, I'll be honest, it's a bit slow. Well, I've I've heard uh, similar things from from other manufacturers as well, from other makers. Um, so I think that that is more of a a sign of the times as opposed to something that has to do with. With in your case, of course, sonar current uh, in general. So every, everyone has said it's been rather slow over the course of the last month and a half. I can say uh, I've got a few of the crossfade arrays out in mm -hmm. artist hands. Well, and you have one. I've got one. <laughs> I, I truly love it. I've been playing with that. So I'm probably going to do the video on that. Uh, hopefully late next week but I've been enjoying it and you can see it uh, featured on some of the streams I've recorded and I absolutely love it to pieces it's so extremely hands-on perfect well and um Spignyev over at uh, Analogova Dusha blog also has got one so I think there's some videos pending the artists I've talked to who have got them in the US have been pretty stoked about it so that's hoping great. once the um, hoping once you know the word gets out, you know, yeah, <laughs> they start to move a little bit. Well, uh, Tom from from Three Tom uh, Synthesizers is already commenting. Aren't people just broke after the holidays? And I think that that is absolutely a spot on comment. Maybe maybe that's just the case, right? Yeah, that could be. <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> oh, and I'm broke. So to, to to be quite fair, so I've been. Str I I told this to to Eric. I've had a tremendously way too busy day today with both my day job, and then during the day we got, um, we got some kind of blockage in our, uh, in our waste system. And we then had a, a leakage in that system. So we had the whole cellar just, oh, and you then have to handle that during your day job while you're working at home. Oh, it's been a nightmare. Uh, but again, this is all the uh, the joys of uh, the pandemic where you're working at home, to making sure that you can handle all of the things. It is what it is, right? And we all make the best of it and, um, of course, yeah, we're 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 just broke after the holiday season as well. So we will get a a a, a, a plumber here next, uh, well, hopefully tomorrow, who's going to fix that, and then I'm going to be really broke after that. <laughs> well, and and I have to admit, I I misbehaved somewhat uh, last month. Um, In what way? Well, how did you misbehave? And is there video well, footage of that? No, there never is. <laughs> um, 
Eric can attest, I'm notoriously difficult to get on camera. Um, there's a picture. I have I have at least one picture of you. Yeah, there there's a picture of us in Berlin. That you, that's um, super, uh, super back in September. Thing. Oh wow! And that's probably the only publicly available picture of me that's been taken in the last twenty years. <laughs> oh, that's great. Maybe thirty, but definitely twenty. Um, but yeah, my my misbehavior was. Uh, I'm broke for a reason that's far more pleasant than yours. I'm afraid. Um, what did you buy? Well, when I saw the notice that Erica Sense was not going to build any more Syntraxes, I had to get one. Oh! <laughs> oh, fantastic. I love that. Um, uh, have, have you got it yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is it sick? Um, it's fantastic. I mean, I sort of expected it would be, but... Um, I kind of, kind of knew what I was getting into, and it was always on my list of like, yeah, someday I might see if I can grab one of those. But they, they forced my hand a little bit since they said they weren't going to be building anymore. Mm. And they've got that, that that absolutely great LED matrix display. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, um, I don't want to take over the stage too much, but... Going back in my history, one of the first things I played with, um, in terms of what you might call a serious synthesizer, was a synthy. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I knew someone with a synthy A back in the 90s. And mm -hmm. it was uh, one of the first times I really sat down and was able to, like, get it to make things that, you know, I wanted to make, not just call up preconceived ideas so mm -hmm. that mindset's always been in the back of my head and I'm certainly never going to have a vintage synthy so I can imagine but still well congrats on grabbing on getting the whole of that that's absolutely fantastic that's a big synth so yeah that's uh I actually probably will be using that in some demos soon I'm looking forward yes, to it already because that's um does it have uh euro rack level outs or no which i oscillate between whether that's a spectacular missed opportunity or whether it's just awesome that it's its own thing so it's all line level then or yeah Ooh. It has cvns which are i think uh euro rack compatible but but okay, so but but those CVNs are still quarter inch, right? Uh yes. Hmm. Interesting. I'll need to look into that. That is absolutely great. So I actually have something kind of saved on it in the studio right now. It's just waiting for me to be less busy with other things to come back when I'm going to do some sort of madness with a <laughs> one of my triad distortions in the crossfade array with that so you need to use the uh, 100 grid by eric then i'm assuming combined with the uh <laughs> with your distortion anyway you'll have two distortions happen at the same time and modulate between them yes well the then oh wow that's something it's one of the things i like the in you know, approaching a crossfade is depends on where you put it. Sometimes I just use it for post oscillator pre filter, like most people would use a mixer. But I really like blending different um, different flavors of the same concept. Yeah, I guess you would say. Absolutely, I love it. I'm looking forward to it already, Graham. Thank you so much. That's great. That's great. Um, any any other questions for uh, for Eric for Graham for me, anyone who else who wants to join the stage, and um, maybe maybe tell us a bit more about the reasons you are broke currently, what kind of great purchases you've made in your uh, synth journey. Oh, I do have a question on the companion channel. A, a Euro Burrow. <laughs> oh yeah, the Euro Bureau. Oh, 
Um, yeah, that's another thing I've, I, I'm working on currently. That is an absolute brilliant thing, Christian. I've had one for a couple of weeks now and it has been phenomenal. So don't you worry, you're gonna be looking into a great weekend ahead of yourself because even I've been I've been working weeks on that and I still can't say I've I've really grasped the overall breadth of that module. Buying uh, stocks would make me pain for more future. I'm <laughs> I'm broke for the same reason that uh three tom is. I haven't I haven't gotten to buy I just all my money goes into stock and sometimes I get to trade it for other people's modules. I haven't and, bought yeah. in this <laughs> and that, and that, and I think that that's one of the, the the best things about the community. Every maker I talk to is is applauding the, especially the inter maker community, and I'm I'm just amazed to hear about those things. I'm just so happy to hear that as well. I want to play with one of those Steve's uh, MS twenty filters. Okay, well, uh, Tom, you hear, you heard it here. Uh, you'll need to trade some uh, some modules with uh, with Eric. 